Hey everyone, January 26th here, Australia Day, and actually my birthday, I get a public holiday every birthday, but I thought I'd do a, um, a live stream just this morning because um, it is a holiday, so I've got some time, and uh, obviously I finished the motorbike, finally, <laughs> those of you who've been following me for the last two and a half years or more, um, would be pleased to know that I did actually finish it, and uh I've got everything set up here hopefully properly so if you can hear me just let me know in the chat i'm going to keep looking across here at the other monitor just to make sure and uh what i want to do just in this short session probably just an hour or less is just um go over the key things that i had to do for um texturing and rendering it was a kind of a unusual project because the bike was uh, pretty pretty heavy as far as topology goes and i had a few problems so I just wanted to wrap all of, wrap this whole project up just by doing this live stream. And if you have any questions, just ask them and uh, we'll go from there. So just let me know whether you can hear me and everything's looking good and um, I'll just get on with it. Excellent. Thanks, uh, Create Better Problems. That's a good name. Thanks, Dahan Brett. Um, all right, so just to recap, so the bike was started, uh, I tweeted about the, this doing this bike model just as a personal project back in 2020 in July. And uh, <laughs> that's a while ago. And started in Cinema 4D because back at that time I was working in Cinema 4D. And uh, did about, um, I don't know, 20% of the bike in Cinema and then switched across to Blender. Check out Blender's modeling tools. And I was doing that with Toby Pittman. And we finished the majority, we finished all the rest of the bike in Blender. And I'm just gonna switch across to my screen here. And Toby and I learned how to use a model in Blender during that time. And Toby did the majority of you know the engine cylinders and you know this section down here. Um, and left it in a state where I could just finish that off and also did the front end, this section down here. I did all the wheels, I did everything else. So Tobe did it probably about 25% and I did 75%. So it was a, it was a dual effort. And um, it was finished in Blender and ended up being about 700 parts. And uh, let me just, I've been in Cinema 4D all week doing rendering and I've got my keyboard shortcuts, uh, my mouse a bit mixed up. I get used to it. I'm kind of bilingual in and once it was finished, I always planned to unwrap it in Ryzen UV. And the first major problem that I had was trying to take the entire bike across to Ryzen at once. Um it was crashing Ryzen. So I think it was just there's too much for it to handle. So I had to split up the unwrap. Um, well, I actually I took I took various parts across, and you can see this in my previous three um, live streams on the motorbike on unwrapping in Ryzen. So I took parts across to Ryzen UV, unwrapped them, and um, eventually got everything unwrapped. And then I had to um, uh, take um, sections across to Ryzen again and lay them out in UDIMs. So I couldn't do everything all at once. So I had to do it in sections. So in rows, starting from the bottom row of UDIMs, you know, if 1001 across, and then the next row, then the next row. So I split it all up. <clears throat> and that way I was able to get everything done. And it was a, it was a pain in the ass. It, it just took a lot of work to do that. Um, but that seemed to be the only way that I could get it to, to be laid out properly. Um, maybe I should have laid it out in Blender, I don't know. <clears throat> um, but once I had the UDIMs done, um, I needed to decide, well, I, I wanted to texture it, obviously, so I had to take it across to Substance Painter, right? Um, and <laughs> I tried to take the entire bike across to Substance, and I was thinking it was going like, to take like five years to bake it. So it was, it was just, I was just waiting and waiting and waiting. It was taking too long, and I just knew that I'd spend all this time baking it, and then it would be so slow in Substance Painter. If you've got any more than, I don't know, 20 UDIMs, it's slows down especially when you work at 4k it's really <laughs> slow so i had to think of a way to get it across to substance painter as well so 
what I ended up doing, um, and you can see um, here I've got in Blender, I've got various collections with different UDIM, UDIM numbers. Um, so I split up the UVs. Th this is how the UVs are laid out. Um, so if I just, for example, select these, all of these objects here, and let me just, one sec, make sure I can select these. Uh, it's unselectable, one sec. So I'm going to select all of these. <coughs> and I split them where possible into UDIMs based on the material, just to try and make it a little easier. So you can see these are all the parts of the um, of the bike that have uh, a, the same material. So what I'm going to quickly do, just to demonstrate, is take this across to Rhizome again. So I'm using the Rhizome UV bridge. So I'm just going to export. And hopefully this all works. And hopefully I don't run out of RAM because I've got all of these applications open. <coughs> um, 3D modeling, Discord, voice chat. Um, not for this one, Patty, no. You'd have to just use the top chat. <coughs> I may do that next time. I can't have you overtaking the um, live stream with all your questions, Patty. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to click export. <coughs> and that's going to... So there you go. So there, there's the um, 3D parts. And if I hit F, sorry, F will make it fit. If I hit E, it's going to show the this part here. I'm going to just come down to my UDIMs and just um, just turn these on. So that was the bottom row of um, UVs. Now before I go on, I just want to talk a little bit about UVs and it caused a bit of a stir on Twitter about, you know, the gaming people came in and go, ooh, those UVs aren't so good. They need to be laid out better. But I'm not doing this for a game. I'm doing it for... Um, obviously doing it for something that's not a game. And I had um, some people chime in, uh, like Andrew Hudson and um, uh, saying, you know, from film that this is perfectly fine to lay it that way, lay it out that way. And it was a good discussion because um, I kind of could see both sides. I'm not an expert at UVs and I'm always trying to get better. Rise of UV makes it much easier for me. But um, as I was doing it, I did see in Substance Painter, some of the things I could have done better. I definitely could have stacked more objects because I had to do multiple layers when I should have really only had to do one layer in Substance. Um, so I think my UVs weren't bad, as bad as they were made out to be by some people, but um, they definitely could have improved. So it was a good discussion. And I hopefully will be discussing UVs more and UV layout and you know ideal, optimal ways to lay out UVs. <coughs> okay, so... So it was too big to get across to Ryzen, it was too big to get across to Substance. So I had to split it up into various um, uh, sections of UDIMs. And like I said, I worked from the bottom of the UDIM grid um, and I took just enough objects across to Substance to make it easier to work with. <coughs> and of course, because I'm working with UDIMs, all I had to do was you know, export um, from Substance Painter into a folder with all the UDIMs in it and I could open up all of these different files individually, make tweaks, update them, and then it wouldn't mess up anything else. So it was, they were, they were all isolated from one another. So I wasn't going to, if I was working on this this particular file, and then I went into another one and made a change, I wasn't going to mess this one up. Um, so let's go across to, I'm going to just actually close that. I'm not going to save. Um, so the next thing, um, actually, no, we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, the next thing was going to go into Substance Painter. I was going to talk about Cinema 4D, but I was going to bring up Substance. So here we are. <coughs> here we are in Substance Painter. I was going to drink water. And there you go. So there's there's those parts of the bike. It's fairly easy to work with. Um, there's the UVs, all laid out as expected. Big part of this process for me 
was using um, Zolotl's live link. So with Zolotl's live link, um, I was able to send objects across from Blender and Cinema 4D across to Substance Painter. So I selected all of those parts, sent them across, and this is the file that was created. And um, once they were textured, I was able to, you know, output them using um, UDIMS and Redshift. So I was able to texture them in here and export them using Zlotl's Live Link using the Redshift setup. Um, and this was for Cinema 4D, of course, because um, Redshift in Blender is not quite there yet. Um, I could have I could have chosen Blender here as well. And you can see I could have chosen Cycles and Eevee and Live Link would have set up all of the um, textures for me automatically in Blender as well. But I decided not to use Blender because I was, and there's a couple of reasons, right? Um, I've spent a lot of time modeling in Blender, but I haven't spent a lot of time texturing and I've, I've got the basics down. So one reason was I wasn't very, I'm not very good at using cycles. The other reason I was running out of um, RAM on my GPU. I've only got an old 1080, a couple of 1080s and I haven't got much RAM. So eight gigs, um, so um, VRAM. And I was really nervous that if I was working at 4K, which I am, um, I was gonna run out of memory and I was gonna be stuck in Blender, not being able to render it the way I wanted to. So I switched across to Redshift because I'm experienced with Redshift in Cinema 4D and it handled 4K and even 8K texture on the floor, no problem. It was a little slow um, to preview, but it, it handled it no problem. Um, didn't work on it full time, create better, no. I was working on other things. This is a personal project. I was doing other personal projects in between and I work full time. So yeah, um, started two years, nine months ago. <laughs> and the, just to just to clarify, the reason I chose a motorbike to do as a personal project because it has hundreds of parts and I wanted to practice modeling all different kinds of things. And it's great because it's got, it's a hard surface model because it's got lots of curves, you know, uh, lots of machine parts, lots of um, uh, you know single single objects that have been um, um, you know the way they're being created means they have to be one single mesh. Um, you know, this a, a motorbike is a great thing to to model just for practice. But all that time, I wasn't doing any UVs. I wasn't doing any practice in Substance Painter, so I was a bit rough <laughs> when I came back to those. Had to um, had to not relearn them, but I had to just um, you know get my uh, my strength back up in those apps. Okay, so once again, Live Link was a really important part of this um, because what it allowed me to do was obviously automatically create the textures. But when I wanted to go backwards and forwards across to Substance, I could um, come back, you know, I could add a little bit more dirt. Like you can see like here, I've added a bit of extra dirt there because it wasn't very dirty, the first few renders. And I wanted to add a little bit of wear and tear. Um, so I was able to come back quickly across to Substance and open up the substance file you can see i've named it 1001 to 1006 which is the udim numbers open that up um, and then make a few tweaks add a few extra um a bit of grunge here i've got the layers here see i've got like um you know my my wear and tear here i'm just going to turn that off let that update you see now it's all clean right it's a little bit of smudginess there in the roughness but just adding a bit of smudginess and wear and tear in there, um, just made it a little dirtier. And I was able to just add that in and then come across to Live Link and then literally just click Update. And Update would re-export those textures into that UDIMS texture folder. And then I come across to um, Redshift and it would automatically update. So it automated the whole process. So if you're working in Blender and Substance Painter or Cinema 4D Substance Painter or even um, uh, whatever host, I mean, there's lots of other hosts that are supported. Get Zolotl Live Link. It's going to save you so much hassle. So even though this was a long process and I had to split everything up, this made things much faster. Okay. 
So I'm not going to go into, you know, how I textured it in Substance Painter. This is just a kind of review session. Um, there's plenty of great tutorials on YouTube about how to use Substance Painter. And to be honest, this wasn't complicated. Um, you know, uh, I pretty much just, just to, just to go into it very basically, um, I'm just going to turn all this off. So there's the, there's the base, right? And, um, let's see. I generally put everything into folders. I group everything into folders and then I will, um, you know, I will use a mask or, a, you know, a black mask on those folders and then choose whatever thing I want to affect just by using the um, uh, the polygon selection or the polygon fill. So you can see how, let me just turn on, let's see, find something here. And you can see it's taking a while to update. I don't even know if I need that particular folder. Um, let me see what I might do. I'll open up a different project and you can see here's all the different ones. Um, let's open up this one, 141 to 145. Substance can be really slow if you've got too many UDIMs in there, too much geometry. And I don't know about you, but I, I can't really work at you know, I definitely can't work at 512 resolution and working at 1024, the textures just don't look how they're going to look. So it's hard to, to work that way. So I'm constantly switching between 2048 and 4096. Okay, so here's another another section, right? Another part. These are all the UDIMs. Let's have a look. There we go. So you can see it's a row of UDIMs that are um, adjacent to one another. Because like I said, I was working my way up the UDIM um, grid. So this has got a bunch of different kinds of materials here. You can see I've used, um, you know, a height map on that particular thing just to you know, add the detail. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about the process of breaking this all up. What I'll do is find something to select. Let's see. Um, Okay, this one here, engine. All right, so I I just alt clicked on the mat, okay, and that showed me what's what's in that group. Okay, so I've got my engine there, right? And inside the engine folder are all of the you know the layers that go to make up the engine. I wonder if I can just move that up a bit so we can see it. Why don't I choose something that's a little bit higher so it may be a little bit easier to see. Let's go, let's go metal. There's only, there's only one metal part in there. It's a little bit there. Let's try something else. Uh, it's a chrome detailing, uh, the mirrors. I'm just alt clicking on each of these. Uh, there's different ways to select things in Substance Painter, but I find using the polygon fill quite, quite easy. Uh, Okay, so here's, here's a good one. This is a gas tank. And I, I've marked this as gas tank because the previous project that we looked at, um, this actually has the same texture. Um, and what I did when I created that previous project was in order to use the same material in this project, I created a smart material. Let me just look in the assets library. I'm going to type in Indian. Uh, just got to make sure I see everything. Indian. Okay, so here's all my assets. So see all these smart materials? These are all, so there's one Indian Scout engine. Um, Indian Scout gas tank. So what I did in the previous project was I saved a smart material because I knew in the other projects I would need to use that same identical material. So I created the material say that it's a smart material and then when I open up this I know that this particular part has to have the same material so I just dragged and dropped it on. I didn't want, you don't want to go recreating the material across different projects. It was just the way I had to work because I had to split this all up. 
if I had it all in one project, I wouldn't necessarily have to do that. I just put every single part that had the same material into the same folder. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, how do I keep organized? Um, I just stay organized, <laughs> just number things, you know, pay attention, but also have, um, you know, auto backup turned on in all of your software, <laughs> okay? Because um, invariably mistakes happen. Okay, so saving smart materials for um, parts of the bike that are going to be used across, you know, multiple different substance projects. Um, and you can see in here that that's the same as the other project. It's got the same layers, obviously, because it was the same smart material. Let's have a quick look at, let's see, um, and naming things is important, obviously. Coming back to this and having no naming is going to be a big problem. Um, let's just keep clicking here until I can find. There's the reflector bowl that's up here. And hit M. So reflector bowl is a good example. So I didn't have to use too many normal maps um, or height maps in here, but I did for certain things, things like the reflector bowl here. Um, we've got the bump. So there's the bump on the side and there's the bump on there. So um, let's go to the layers. Where am I? Let's see. Base, that's the bump there. Okay, yeah. So what I've done is I've applied a mask. This is the way I often work. I'll, I'll um, create a new fill then I'll apply a black mask and then I'll add a fill. Add a fill that way and then work that way. I just find that's a, a better, more efficient way to work. So when I select the fill and have a look down here, you can see there's the grayscale gray reflector bowl um, file. So I went into Photoshop. Let me see if I can find that file. And I created all of my height maps in Photoshop and Illustrator. So let's go, where are we? decals. I call them decals, but <laughs> obviously I've rendered something into there that shouldn't be there. Let's just get rid of that. <laughs> you often do that. M mean to render out a single frame and end up, end up rendering out a whole sequence into a folder. It's going to get rid of that. Okay, so these are all, and I'm, it's not going to show you the thumbnails, of course, in Windows, but, um, oh no, it does. Okay. Yeah, so these are all of the um, the different height maps that I created. This one was created um, for the indicators, the breaks in Illustrator and brought across to Photoshop. Mostly Illustrator um, and then just saved as, you know, fairly large alphas. And there's the headlight reflector bowl. You can see I've got a few different ones. I was trying different ones. Um, and just the various, you know, bits and pieces that get add the detail to the bike. So they were all created in Photoshop and Illustrator. And then brought in as a gray, as a grayscale layer and then, you know, mapped using height. So the thing about using a fill like this is I can come back to the actual layer itself and I haven't dragged that reflector bowl into the height channel here, which would remove the slider, right? But by having it on a fill, this keeps this slider so I can adjust the height, see, just by doing this. So it's, it's nice to use a fill effect on a fill layer and it gives you, it, rem it maintains access to these sliders, which is a really nice way to work. So I can just go in and fine tune. There are other ways to do it. There's other ways to control the height, but I like doing it this way. It was so fun to come and finally texture this bike after... Um, you know, after doing um, all of that modeling. So, and the same thing, you know, same thing for this, did exactly the same thing. So, this isn't a, a substance painter tutorial, but um, that's just the approach I did for everything. All right, I'm just going to close that up. Uh, let's see, just close that. Discard. 
And let's talk about Cinema 4D. We already talked about me um, going across to Cinema using Redshift. Um, so I'm just going to close up Blender for now. Blender did a great job with the modeling. I loved modeling this bike in Blender. And the process of modeling the bike in Blender now has me as a full-time, you know, Blender user for modeling. Um, this week I was tweeting about enjoying going back to uh, Redshift in Cinema 4D and I really have enjoyed that. So what I'll probably end up being doing is doing pretty much all of my modeling in Blender and then <laughs> doing my um, comping and uh, doing my uh, rendering and lighting in Redshift. That just seems to be a quite a nice way to work. But I will keep learning cycles you know, and, and as it improves. You know, hopefully adding things like light linking and stuff will be good. I'm not going to save that. Okay, so here I am across in Cinema 4D. And all I did was save the bike as an FVX in Blender and opened it up in Cinema as an FVX. Um, and you can see there's all of my uh, groups with all of the different parts in it. And if I select... 101, 1001 to 1006. There's those ones that we um, talked about earlier, and of course, I've, I'm using an early version, earlier version, 20 version um, R23, um, and I mean I'm sure you can get the Ryzen Bridge for 2023 version of Cinema as well, but I just happen to be using this version, and if I wanted to, I could go across to Ryzen UV you know, and tweak just by using the bridge in Cinema as well. So there's a bridge as well. So I could select those, click that, opens up Ryzen UV. Um, I'm going to get rid of that one there. So um, it looks really weird because this is the way it kind of maps the UDIMs. Um, but if I open up the... I'll talk a little bit about the lighting now. Um, if I open up the renderer where is it here we go hopefully we won't run out of ram there's the bike there so that's um the lit bike in the redshift render view and i had a bit of a time with the new uh, uh the color um what do you call it um uh, aces and all that kind of stuff right um because um i, I haven't, haven't used aces before and the workflow has changed somewhat. So I had a bit of trouble kind of um, uh, reconciling what I was getting from Substance Painter across in Cinema 4D. There's certain information out there, but I'm, I'm not, this is not using the ACES workflow and it's something I have to get to learn. I haven't used that. This is just using a linear workflow. Um, so let's take a quick look. I'll just turn this on. And I don't know if you can see the bottom right-hand corner, but it's extracting the geometry, blah, blah, blah. It was pretty slow. Okay, there we go. Um, not too bad. I do like um, using Redshift. It's, it, it worked pretty well. I'm just going to... Maybe I can just dock this so we can see both. There we go. So, you know, it's pretty responsive. Um works pretty well. I've got, at the moment, I've got tessellation turned off. So to to add the um, subdivision, the extra level of subdivision, I just use the cinema, uh, the Redshift object tag and just use the geometry option and just te use tessellation. And that was great. I didn't have to use um, um, sub-D surface modifiers or anything like that, right? Hopefully this is not um, going over your heads. Um, so the bike was in here. The materials have been sent across from Substance Painter. So of course I had to light the whole thing. And I mean, I'm a reasonably experienced lighter, but I'm always trying to improve. Um, I don't think I'm an expert at lighting. And I, I personally feel the final result, the final renders looked pretty good, but they didn't look as lifelike as I'd, as I'd hoped. I am actually doing a compositing tutorial for Boris FX, my the company that I work for. Um, and yesterday I spent quite a bit of time in Cinema 4D and Redshift um, working with um, um, the, what do you call it, um, 
um, shadow catching and that kind of stuff. So to try and get the comp composite looking more realistic. So I'm going to break that down and how I've used After Effects and Boris Effects effects, Sapphire and Continuum to do the final comping. And I think the final result that I was getting yesterday is looks a lot more realistic than the, than the final ones I actually put out there. Let's have a quick look at um, just my process for lighting, uh, lighting this. Uh, what we might do is come back to the, I've already messed up the camera, of course, because I didn't have the, um, this is me getting used to my keyboard shortcuts again. Uh, there we go. It's, it, I don't know, if, I don't know about you, but I'm often, um, setting up a camera and then inadvertently moving the camera, um, and losing the, the, uh, the, um, the angle. So what I do is just use a um, protection tag. That's what I should have had on there. Uh, that's okay. We can just do it like this. So my process, the process I used for lighting this was, um, it's a combination of HDRs and area lights. I'm going to just turn off, um, turn off the lights for now. So I've got to get everything turned off. And we're going to go black. And we'll see. Hopefully we won't get a crash. <laughs> Okay, and this is kind of like what I did have to deal with. There we go, it did crash. All right, I'm gonna just open that again. That's actually good because it's not gonna, um, my camera won't be messed up. Hmm. <coughs> I'm only spent about uh, what, four, maybe four days on the actual um, uh, lighting and compositing. I think I probably could have spent longer, but I was just over it. Uh, wrong one. Here we go. Let's bring that back across. Let's open up a recent file, which is this one. Actually, no, it's this one. No, it's this one. Okay. We put that protection tag on the camera and let's just launch the IPR again. Give it a moment. Oh, got to turn it on. Hmm. Here we go. Preparing materials and shaders. So my um <coughs> my GPU seemed to handle this pretty well, um, but you can see with this many parts to the bike, it is taking a while. So it was a little slow. There we go. So there it is. That's how it was looking before. So I'll just dock this again. Hopefully we won't get another crash. I actually didn't get that many crashes at all. Um, it was just slow. Just for some reason today it's crashed, of course. Okay. All right. So I'll just zoom out a little bit there. And let's just talk quickly about how I approach the lighting for this. Um, I'll just turn these off again. Hopefully it won't crash. Might just get rid of this and this. Um, and we'll just bring these and turn them all off. And it should go black. There we go. So there's no lights in the scene. Okay, I've turned off the default light too. So like I said, I use a combination of um, area lights and I like to add a few reflections using a dome light, using an HDR. And in this case, um, I used Grayscale Gorilla's HDR pack um, using HDRI Link. And I do like the Grayscale Gorilla stuff when I'm using Cinema 4D, it's excellent. I'm gonna turn that on. And so this is using um, one of the Pro Studio medals. I think it's number 44. 
this one down here. Yeah, this one down here. So it's using that one there. Um, I do have Cinema 4D 2023 installed and I am using Grayscale Gorilla Plus. And Grayscale Gorilla Plus has a second Pro Studio Metals pack, which has got some really good ones in there as well. So um, I've been using those for some stuff I'm doing for Boris FX as well for glass and it looks fantastic. So yeah, so that's the HDR that I use. And once I've got it in there, just go across to coordinates, you know, and then just um, just playing with the heading, you know, just so just rotating, rotating that around, seeing, you know, where it might be nicely placed. I'm just going to undo that for now. Um, and obviously the final lighting is a combination of lights, but it's no good just putting a bunch of lights in and then just trying to change one while all the other lights are on. It's better, I think, to put lights on one at a time. So I didn't actually start with the dome light. Um, I started with a key light. And I'm just going to come over here and come to camera 1B, just make sure that's locked. Yeah, it's locked. Okay, so now if I come to cameras here and choose default camera. So this is my key light. Uh, trying to give myself a bit of space here. Let's see. Hopefully this will work. I wasn't sure whether this was going to work while, while I was live streaming as well. It's hanging again now. Ah, it's crashed again. Isn't that excellent? Listen, we'll try one more time. Um, and we'll see how we go. I wasn't getting those crashes when I was doing it, luckily. And recent projects, recent files. All right. Um, yeah, what I'll do is I, I won't put the IPR on. Just see if it doesn't. Let's see if it uh, doesn't crash. So I've got my key light, um, and this is for this. I'm using an old. Um, a little setup from Tim Clapham from Hello Lux. This is actually just a little bit of user data here where he has linked things up for heading, pitch and distance. So this is my area light right here. That one right there. You can see it in the different views. And the good thing about this little uh, setup that Tim created, and I love this, is because um, what I can do is I can just use the user data and just adjust the heading. See, I can rotate that around the object. And obviously I'm looking in the IPR. You can see it changing the lighting in here. Um, I'm looking in the IPR while I'm doing this and getting it in the right place. So, you know, just trying to ping it off the highlights. Um, and I can change the pitch. So I can move it up or down like that. And I can also change the distance, so make it brighter or darker. This is just a nice little setup from Tim that I always use when I'm using area lights um, in Redshift. I'll close that up. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so like I said before, I'll just do one light at a time and just turn all these off. So turn on my key light. And once I've got my key light set up, I'll turn that off. And then I'll turn on my fill light and same for, same for this, you know, maybe it's a little warmer, that light's slightly warmer and get that over the other side just to sort of fill in the shadows a little bit, turn that off. And by then I probably wanted to put in the HDRI. So, you know, adding that in as well. And like I said, just using the coordinates just to change the heading on that and getting sort of base lighting going, um, you know, adding in a backlight. So that's the light behind. So pushing behind the bike to add a sort of halo around the edges. Um, and you can see I can do that as well. So behind the bike. And I also added in a top light just so I could light, um, create some shadows underneath the bike. 
Um, and also there's a floor light as well because I had a floor and I just had these as separate lights. I didn't actually use the setup from Tim. I don't know why. Um, but there's my floor light there as well. So the key the key thing is um, doing you're adding your lights one at a time. And then when you've got it all kind of set up individually, how they look good, turn them all on. And then you can tweak individual ones to get it looking, you know, as good as it can. Let's have a look at a couple of the renders. Uh, let's go renders. And it's in here. So um, there's some JPEGs here. Yeah, so um, that's basically the result of the, that lighting. Um, you know, I've got the, the backlight just pinging off the edges of the bike so it sort of separates it from the background. Um, I'm going to talk about comping this up in the, in the next tutorial that I do. Um, you know, another one there, all done using that lighting setup. Um, you can see how we've got slightly, slightly warmer lights there from the fill. Um, slightly bluer lights from, um, I think that's from the HDRI and slightly wider lights from the key. I just try and, when I do this, I try and, I try and get lights in a, in a position where it highlights the sort of key features of the bike without over lighting it, without flattening it. I was always taught that lighting should sculpt the object. You know, you sculpt the object out of its background using light. If you put too much light in it, everything gets flat, right? Um, I just like in this particular one how the light adds this kind of gradient here of light. You know, some sort of lighter down the bottom and darker at the top. It just makes it more interesting. Um, but you've got nice, you know, nice specular highlights pinging off certain things, but nothing is overlit. Um, I didn't have to do too much light linking in Redshift either. There's a little bit of light linking. Um, just to make sure that certain things weren't, you know, blown out. Um, there you go. So just trying to get the balance right. You know, could I have done it better? Probably. Um, but I think it ended up coming out pretty well. This is just an image um, that I got online. Free image. Um, yeah, all, all, all lit the same way. But what I did was, rather than having all of the lighting in one project, I found from experience that I often want to go back and tweak these. And invariably, when I'm setting up the Cinema 4D project and I've got all of the lights um, and all of the bike positions in one project, I mess it up. So what I did was I um, did the first light setup, had the bike and the camera, you know, the way I wanted it. Uh, render that out, save that as version 2, move the camera, maybe move the bike, move the light, save that out. Ended up with like 23 different Cinema 4D files, each with the setup inside it. Um, <coughs> maybe you might want to work a different way, but I just know that when I go back to number 20, 21 or number 8, it'll be exactly as I left it, you know. Um, so I wanted to do a few close-ups. And you can see there's the, you know, sort of a little bit of dirt in there. And, um, you know, I've got the, um, uh, you know, the brake plate there looking, looking reasonably realistic. You know, height maps on the, on the wheels. Um, did all the glass and re reflections and stuff as separate materials in Redshift. That worked out really well. Um, and, you know, things like, there's, there's that um, chrome that we looked at in Substance Painter. You know, all of the sort of text on there, details inside the bulbs. Um, out of that, that was one of the last things I did was just model the filaments in the bulbs. Um, you know, detail on the glass. Um, all the decals. Decals there. It was nice to finally texture this as well, the actual gas cap. Um, you know, decals on those. Toby did all these, he modeled all of these. It was nice to get, you know, all of this plastic in here and different kinds of plastic. Um, 
what else that's another nice shot I like that one i like that one it's nice to do these close-ups you know using depth of field adding a bit of dust in there um, a bit of leather it could have looked a little better i would have liked to spend a bit more time on that um, but it came out okay and of course the engine um, a lot of work on the engine a lot of the details were actually modeled in like the little eyes that was actually part of the model and uh, you know, this has all been modeled in um, you can see by actually making this part of the model and stitching it on you can get some really nice reflections it's not just an Indian logo that's been intersect is intersecting it's actually part of the model so it's all one piece and you know, other little details um, I do like I think with these kind of things you, you you need to really create um dynamic angles you know this is a this is a tough looking motorbike so i think you know having the camera on the floor and looking up at it um makes it look a little more interesting a little more dynamic uh there's some brushed brushed metal from substance painter on the logo um you know, some some more bumpy metal on the top of the cylinder heads Again, this is another example of you know, stick having the actual um, geometry connected. Gives you a really nice finished result. I, I grabbed my um, Punisher keychain from the hot rod. I thought I'd make a little family by adding the Punisher keychain back in. Sure, I can explain that. Um, yeah, no, it's, a, it's, not, it's not fully detailed on the inside, but I just modeled enough to make it um look fully detailed inside you know in the engine um uh, this is a height map from photoshop for the radiator that's not geometry um you know but it's just nice to have a, just enough detail in there to make it look realistic one thing i'm not happy with is the welds now this is actually a good example this is separate geometry from the actual um swing arm I just I just I cheated it and I added some welds in Substance Painter and it just didn't come out well. You can see that line there. That's not a good look. Uh, not so bad there, but it would have been way better if I'd have actually got my edge flow correct on the swing arm and had that actually extruded out so it was part of part of the swing arm and then I could have put a really nice weld over it and it would have looked you know schmicky. Um, but everything else is quite good. You see, there's all these little details down here. Um, and there's the engine. I wanted to just highlight the engine because Toby did such a good job of all of this. Um, Toby did the cylinder heads um, and you know this, these parts in here, these main parts, um, and, a, and, a, and a huge part of, this, of the body of the engine, the engine block. But I had to go in and stitch everything in. I had to actually go and attach the cylinder heads to the engine block um, and add in a whole bunch of you know details, these these little things. Um, so there was a fair bit of work. I had to re had to build the whole sides of it, um, finish the bottom. It was quite nice to take Toby's project take model and just keep working with it. He's such a good modeler. Um, you know, Toby did this one here, but I had to go down and rework this to create a space for the uh, exhaust pipe. Um, and I also did this one as well. That one came out quite nice. This was all modeled um, starting with uh, Boolean objects. So creating the basic shape with, through Booleans and then um, retoppoing onto it manually, manual retoppo. But the result is amazing. I mean, it's so clean. Um, And I think this is probably just, and there's, there's one there. So you can see the um, topology there. And there, there's an example of that being stitched in, right? And stitched on. And just textured in Substance Painter. So yeah, so that's the finished bike. Um, really happy to have it done. It's nice to have it done. Um, already moving on to other things now. Now, I've got a question, a um, couple of questions here. Uh, understanding 3D, yeah, any advice on understanding 3D topology? Yep. Um, do lots of modeling. 
and practice. Um, watch Making It Look Great 11. If you haven't watched Making It Look Great 11, um, if you don't know of Making It Look Great 11, um, let's find it. So Making It Look Great 11 was um, created by myself and Toby Pittman. Toby recorded all of these. He's the expert modeler in this. This is 24 hours of training. It's it's five or six years old now, but the amount of information on geometry, um, you know, edge flow, edge loops, um, subdivision basics, all of this is irrespective of what software you use. It's done in Cinema 4D, but if you want to understand 3D topology better, watch this training. Okay, there's other things as well on YouTube and the other training out there, but this is um, a lot of people swear by this. And um, another question. Yeah, height map in Photoshop. Let's just let's just have a quick look. So decals. Um. Yeah, so let's go, um, let's see, which one is the best one to choose? Most of them I created in Illustrator first, and then I just took them across to Photoshop to save out. Um, let's go, uh, which one can I find? Here's one. This is the rear brake light. Let's open up Illustrator. It's going to open up on the other screen. So hit me up with other questions because um, I'm going to wrap it up in a minute. Light bulb. Okay. Let's see if this... What do we got here? Here we go. Right. So there's the for finding reference images is the hardest thing with this. Um, this is actually a slightly different one from the one that I um, ended up using. There are other images of it, but this is actually how it how it came out. So this is all done in um, Illustrator. And I'm not going to do an Illustrator tutorial on how to do this. You just need to watch the Illustrator training. So I grabbed it all. I just find it's easier to work with these kind of things in Illustrator. Um, and then copied and pasted it across to Photoshop. And where is it? Got the PNG. Just launch Photoshop. And, you know, you just got to find good references. Um, find Hopefully, you can find, like, this Indian motorcycle um, logo here. Um, I just found a really good reference of it. And I was able just to literally just not even actually re recreate it. Just grab that and just create a black and white version of it. Um, that's usually the best thing to do. Let's just pull this across. I can. Ah, it's trying to go across to my other monitor. One sec. So annoying. My other monitor is a higher resolution. Let me just bring that across. See if that works. Ah, uh, come on. There we go. In you go. So there it is. So there it is. So that's just um, copied and pasted across from Illustrator, and I save that. Um, as a PNG, and then just bring that into Substance Painter, and that's that becomes my um, uh, that becomes my alpha. Let's get rid of that. Go on Photoshop. I'm misbehaving. Um, yeah, so that's just how I approach that. But if you can try and find um, you know an image that you can use directly rather than having to recreate it. Um, light bulb, please. Um, what does that actually mean, Faramaz? Do you want to see the light bulb? 
let's go display uh, we want to go options and turn off materials let's have a look see if we can find it So, um, I just found references of actual light bulbs, you know, for this particular bike, and this is not uh, this is not identical, but um, you know, just modeled that in Blender. Um, obviously, we're not very close to it, so you don't see much. And this one's this one's pretty rough. <laughs> see, it's not even not even connected there. Um, but yeah, that's just quickly modeled in Blender, just to add a little bit more detail. I'm not sure what else I can add to that. Um, you know, little things like this where I've got this part extruded here, and then have the light overlap it, looks more realistic because obviously this is, you know, plastic, and you can see through this, so you actually see that extrusion through there. It looks more realistic. If I have a look at the um, have a look at the renders again, I can show you. Uh, let's find an example. That's a bit hard to see there. Oh, you can see it there. You can see through there, and you can see that looks really nice. You can also see there's those there's there's the bump um, adding that detail now. I'll just grab another image because um, that's in Photoshop. I want to have this in. I want to have the JPEG. I'll just grab another image because I want to show you something. So there's the there's the uh, indicator light for the actual texturing for the bump. I place the bump on the inside right um, and that way I get a nice smooth outside I know you can use um, uh, what do you call it the technique um, uh, I can't remember what it's called but um, I'm just used to doing it this way so I just place the bump on the inside and um, there are other ways to do it that kind of worked same, same for these reflectors as well just the name eludes me for the moment um the radial height in the light bulb radial height i mean i mean can you ask me the question i don't know what you're even asking me can you ask me a specific question <laughs> do you want to see something explain the making the height alpha in Photoshop, radial height in the light bulb. Okay, you mean in the reflector? Um, so this one here. So here I've got, um, you know, just a circle, and I've got a bunch of bars like that and they've all got you know gradients on them so just controlled and just adjusting the gradient just to create that sort of roundness and that's how i created that just grab that copied it and pasted it across to photoshop um, And I'm not going to do that right now because Photoshop just won't open up on this screen. But that's but that's basically what I did. Um, that's the way I created that. All right, so it's um, it's one hour. Uh, I know that was a lot of talking from me, and I know there wasn't a lot of detail, but I just wanted to wrap up with you some of the things that um, uh, the way I approach this, uh, just to put a bow on it. Um, 
if you have any more questions, just you know, leave a comment. If you want to see something very specific, maybe in a tutorial, just let me know. I'll see how I go. Um, but I will be coming up with a um, tutorial very soon for Boris Effects on compositing this, taking this from Redshift across to After Effects and setting up the composite of the composite. Yep. All right. Okay. I am going to just switch across to my camera and thanks for watching. Um, hopefully that was useful for you. The bike project is, other than the compositing tutorial, is finished now. Um, and I haven't decided whether I'm going to actually sell it or not. I don't know. We'll see. But um, it's been a big project. I think I'll just stick to some smaller projects now. Just um, get my rendering, my modeling in Blender um, better and better. Maybe I'll do some more how to model in Blender tutorials. We'll see how it goes. But um, for now, thanks for watching. And I will see you in the next live stream.